Yes. Oh, and we're live and we're good to go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another NIDA in Conversation. My name is Bryony McKim, and joining me today is Shari Sabins, the amazing, the incomparable. How are you doing today, Shari? I'm very well, thanks, mate. A bit excited okay. to be chatting, a bit excited to have Beck, our Auslan interpreter here. This is awesome. Yeah, it's so exciting. Ah. Um, I guess I, today I was like, oh, I'll do the little acknowledgement for both of us. We've had a little discussion about our intro today. Um, yeah. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, I think it's really important for all of us to remember that they're not empty words, land acknowledgements, country acknowledgements, especially when we're all in the business of storytelling. And this is the content, the home, the country of some of the oldest stories in the, in the history of humankind. Um, Bridie, you are on Turrbal and Yuggera land up in I'm Brisbane. Sure yeah. Very jealous of that humidity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we've chatted, uh, we've chatted about our pronouns today. I'm, I, we both uh, like to be identified she, her. And for vision impaired mob out there, I am wearing a dark blue top. My hair is half up, half down. I've slept on a quick five minute makeup face <laughs> with some berry colored lip gloss <laughs> and <laughs> My room looks clean in the background, but beneath me is a total mess. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and I am wearing a black top um, and I have my hair slipped back because I'm hot and sweaty, but no one needs to know that. They do now. And I also have a five minute makeup job um, <laughs> and I have a white background and I have brownish, blondish hair. Mm -hmm. And that's that. That's us. And yeah. I think it's... Um, We'd also like to acknowledge that today is uh, International Day of People with a Disability. Yes, happy International yes. Day of People with a Disability. So exciting. <laughs> so good. Such a special day and such an it exciting is. day to do this and talk to you, Shari. So thank you for being oh, here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. So, I mean, the biggest question that we've all had and the great um, icebreaker we all have this year is how, how has COVID been treating you? How's 2020? Oh. <laughs> 2020. It's so funny because we're at the tail end of the year, isn't it, where we all get reflective yeah. and we all kind of think back on the year that was. And But I feel like I've done a lot of reflecting through the year anyway. Um, look, I'm, uh, I have to acknowledge my, my privilege as an Aboriginal woman in the, in, in the arts industry specifically this year. I was really fortunate to move into my position with Sydney Theatre Company as a resident director. Uh, which has meant that I was able to get my job keeper allowance every week. Wow, that's <laughs> um, a, dream. a massive, massive win. And uh, I know it, it's something that a lot of people didn't have. And um, yeah, and I, I also managed to get a, a play up, my first directorial uh, debut, which again, small miracle in, in <laughs> the year that is 2020. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I've had a pretty good run and I, I can't say anything bad about my year and you know it's that funny thing where you you know lear learning not to feel guilty about having a having a really fortunate position but doing 100 yeah doing what I can to kind of help empower and um, support those those fortunate throughout the year yeah. yeah and I think you've done a beautiful job of that oh, it's really cool. amazing so you made your directorial debut this year yeah. and I remember this time last year I hope you're okay with me saying this but we were having a chat about it because it was so exciting and you just found out you had these amazing opportunities to direct a play and I remember so vividly asking what made you want to direct what made you want to like take on that new type of challenge and you said to me um, I just realized so many of my male colleagues and my male peers have made that transition and have taken on those opportunities and I thought to myself why can't I do that too I can do that too is that still a kind of idea that resonates with you and drives you and how did that all come about for you yeah yeah it's it definitely was that kind of going you know I, I um I think often as women where uh although in society we're expected to carry many roles that of mother or sister or daughter or nurturer as well as professional roles, as well as, um, you know, they're both, they're all demanding jobs. Um, but not often, I think uh, myself, you know, I kind of went, oh, I hadn't, I realised that, yeah, a lot of dudes in my life 
Um, a lot of male artists that I work with have the little slashies between after that, you know, their directors, writers, actors. And I was like, I can do that, I reckon. So um, it also just felt naturally like a, a transition to make into making sure that I'm opening the door or keeping the door open for emerging, you know, new talent coming through. Um, you know, young, young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, Indigenous artists and people of colour and, um, yeah, it felt like it was time. And I, and I must admit, though, the people who had encouraged me to put on my directing hat or, or venture into that field were all women. So there was a, um, yeah, a sense of, like, it's the right time. It feels like the right time. I've learnt enough. And, um, but in saying that, I don't think you have to wait for the right time as a woman. Mm. I think you just, that's where the... Uh, I guess the inspiration about men, men doing it, they just did it whenever they wanted to really. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh yeah, give it a go. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So you took it on, you did your first show. Um, like what was the process like? And also what was it like um, being an actor turned director for that project? Was yeah. that quite fascinating or interesting? Yeah, it was it was really really interesting because I I know if, you know as as all the actors out there will know we understand what happens once we rock up to the first day of rehearsal you know ten till six every weekday ten till two on on Saturday um, we know the process of what happens when we're on the floor but for me what was missing was all the I guess you know in film it's pre production um, and I, I don't really know in theater it's just called prep preparation really um, all those all those conversations that happened prior to the rehearsal room with the creatives um, and, and all the conversations that happened throughout the rehearsal process. Uh, and even right up until opening night, this was the first, I, I actually text my best mate Paige Rattray, the incredible Paige Rattray, and apologised to her. I was like, oh my gosh, I always thought previews were for actors, but they're just so not for actors. <laughs> Tech Week and previews are just all about the show <laughs> and mm. then for all the creatives on the everyone on the other side to go all right what's this thing that we think we've been putting together in a, in a room with sticky tape on the floor and now we're suddenly in a space with a set and we've got costumes and light and sound and, and everything's coming together and uh, I, I think that was the biggest kind of um, light bulb or just the, the most insightful moment for me was like every preview is so, so pertinent to the process and, yeah. and it's actually kind of just as important as the rehearsals mm. in a weird way. Um, yeah, so that, I guess that was my, one yeah. of my biggest things. The other one was actually just wanting to make sure that I, I enjoyed it. I, I was, I had two concerns that I, I'd spend the whole time going, oh no, I really wish I was up there acting instead. FOMO <laughs> is I'm real, FOMO is real. <laughs> yeah, but thankfully I, Friggin' loved being on the other side, and um, and my goal going in was I just want these actors to feel stronger and and better at the end of this process than they did at the start, um, yeah. and I want them to feel supported and empowered. Um, and then my other panic that set in was, oh my gosh, is this just going to be three different versions of me up there on stage? <laughs> was it? <laughs> uh, well, you know what? In a really lovely way, one of my best mates said it was, but that was the beauty of it. Like you know, my understanding of, of the, the work is it's always going to be through the director. So a little part of you was always going to be in how you interpret the text and, and discover things for, through the actors. But they said it, it was that in a very gentle and um, uh, um, I guess kind of fruitful way. It, yeah. it, you know, it supported the work and didn't uh, hinder it with any, any, any Shari vision. <laughs> <laughs> I love a bit of Shari vision. It's great. <laughs> nothing wrong with that <laughs> that was amazing yeah. so Shari you studied at NIDA back in the day I did and what how old were you when you got into NIDA I was uh I turned 23 in the the April that I started so 23 to yeah 20 by the time I got out I was like 26 yeah nice yeah. nice and you're a Darwin girl I am a Darwin girl born so in <laughs> Amazing. So what was that like going from Darwin to Sydney Drama School, NIDA? What was that whole process like for you? It was, it was hard. It was, um, I, I grew up on Larrakia country uh, and then I moved to Nullumboy, which is um, Yolngul country and northeast Arnhem Land. And from there I got into the Aboriginal theatre course at Whopper. 
yeah. which is a one year course. And I was really, that's where I was kind of prepped and honed and, and um, built up for the, the, the uh, three year, prepared for the three year kind of commitment. Um, but I did also spend, I knew that I wanted to go to NIDA from when I was 13 and I saw drama school, which was the Channel 7 reality show. I love <laughs> that show. Well, thankfully, I saw just enough of it to want to go to NIDA and not enough to terrify me away from it, to scare me away. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah. It, so, yeah, it was, it was, I think, for any student that knows that has to move it's it's a big tough thing you know whether you're coming from western sydney or melbourne or brizzy um it's always kind of the further you know if you're away from family and friends and your community it's a, it's a big ask to kind of pack up and and be on your own while you're learning all of these very strange things about yourself <laughs> yeah and so many um personal things and it's yeah. like const constant inward reflection yes which can be really really intense yeah so what how did you manage that what structures did you put into place uh the best thing that ever was said to me prior to drama school um rick brayford who still runs the aboriginal theater course at Whopper, he knew i made it very clear to him at the start of my year there that i wanted to audition for drama schools at the end and and he said to me you've just got to remember that any of the criticism you get any of the feedback it's not personal it's about the work and so I had a, quite a, um, I had a year of him drilling that into me. And so I built up this resilience, I guess, to kind of learn, to learn to be respectful of my teachers and, and, and my classmates, but to take what I need and, um, you know, put, leave some things on the burner. They might not apply to me just then. They might apply in a few months or a few years. But the biggest thing was I'm just going to block out, block out the haters and um, <laughs> um, use what I need to get better as an actor, yeah. That's so good. That would have been really empowering advice. It was. I think there's also a natural resilience walking into any um, any environment when you're an Indigenous person and, you know, you've kind of naturally got a bit of, bit of resilience built up in your DNA. Um, not to say that things are any less uh, confronting or stressful or hurtful. Um, but, it, yeah, I, I think um, just reminding myself, even when it felt personal, and one could argue that it was personal. I would just tell myself it's not, it's about the work. So just take what I need and keep on going. Yeah, that's an amazing perspective. That's really cool. So w tell me, was it that moment as a 13 year old watching drama school, was that the moment where you knew you wanted to be an actor or was it something before? Where did it come from for you? Um, I was 11 when I started doing drama classes because my best friend was doing youth theatre drama classes of course and so I, of course you know you're 11 and you want to yeah. do everything your best friend does yeah um so I what I joined because of her and then she quit but I kept going mm -hmm. uh, so by the time I was uh probably 12 is when I was like this is what I want to do um but I can I've, I've been asked this question a lot and I've, I've realized over the years I can pinpoint it back to when I was eight years old and mm. Brand New Day, which is the um, maybe the first Aboriginal musical, had been touring Australia and it was written by Uncle Jimmy Chai um, and it, people, all the cast were made up of my cousins and aunties and uncles and uh, I was eight years old watching it at the Darwin Entertainment Centre and my cousin Gary Lang, who's an incredible dancer, took me backstage to meet everyone. And <gasps> it was it would have been like, magic. It was. It actually felt like magic yeah I always it just it's like a flurry of colors and and sounds and and um just energy buzzing in my head my memory is filled with that kind of just a buzz and I I know that that's definitely the seed that's where the seed was planted for sure yeah that's incredible so what what has been your favorite role to date oh I'm a real like um I I like I fall in love with every single role as it comes along. Mm. This is a just grateful to have a role to come along. So it's Amen like, to that. <laughs> this is my we're working. We're employed. <laughs> <laughs> yep, they all become your favorite very quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think. I mean, it goes without saying that uh, my character of Kay in the Sapphires uh, was just incredible. A, a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, but it, particularly important for me because it was the first time, um, I, I suppose, the conversation about 
you know, uh, it wasn't the first time Stolen Generation conversation had been had on screen or stage, but it was the first time we'd look, we'd seen a fair skin Aboriginal person um, as part of a community and, and being accepted and, and welcomed back into a community. And um, it really reflected, you know, my, like myself growing up, I guess. Yeah. Um, and that's such important representation. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, um, The Bleeding Tree, uh, Every Role is my favourite in that um, by Angus Cerini. We did that at Griffin and then Sydney Theatre Company. And uh, then Black is the New White, which I have to... I just love it because it's such a feel-good play. So good, that play is so good. Oh, isn't it so good? <laughs> Incredible. It's like such a party but like so um, engaging and so important and so thought-provoking at the same time. It's incredible. Yeah. It covers the whole spectrum. I know. She yeah. really, Nakia Louie. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so in the Sapphires, was that, um, had you done musicals before and had you sung before and done choreography? How did no, that work? I, um, to be honest, I my two fa- least favourite genres of film and musicals and romantic comedies. So. <laughs> the role was perfect for you then. <laughs> Um, and and um, actually, the uh, we didn't sing in Sapphires. Jess Malboy is the only singer. Um, Sony mm-hmm. kind of already re-recorded all their artists and kept it on the Sony books. And um, correct. Um, yeah, I, Deb Malman sang in the musical at Belvoir. Um, but it was my. I mean, you know, I did the kind of the standard musical theatre um, term, or I guess whatever semester or whatever it is at, at NIDA. Yeah. Um, so, and the choreography. Thankfully, we had a week we had almost two weeks on choreography which was really great mm-hmm. um but um yes it was not something that I expected to be my first <laughs> no <laughs> you made it work though you pulled it off like not tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> so good and then I was privileged enough to meet you and work with you on the heights when we Yay! started filming in 2018 over in Perth um, and we were lucky enough to shoot 60 episodes on that incredible show. We were very fortunate on that amazing, I think the first show that feels like they got it right. They just did the thing they were going to say they did in terms of inclusivity um, and diverse representation on and off screen. Um, I know they, by uh, first season, they'd reached um, above, beyond gender parity, 52% of the women, 52% of the um, crew were women and that's head of departments and and production office and and everything so that was a really really special show to be involved yeah 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 Yeah. that was a magical show to be it was it so was you and you and Roz I I swear my favorite I never got into Gilmore Girls but I imagine it's the same kind of fangirling (laughs) that people do over that mother and daughter (laughs) you can't well I've actually never seen Gilmore Girls and everyone's like oh you like the Gilmore Girls and I would just smile and nod and be like Good, thank you. Oh, yeah, great show. <laughs> How did you find playing Leone? Yeah, that was it. Was quite a um, it was a bit of a challenge at the start, I suppose. I came in quite late to the process, um, and and I um, obviously you know Leone's meant to be uh, probably a good sort of five to ten years older than than myself at the time of filming. Mm. Um, so we had a bit of um, reworking to do behind the scenes uh, with consultants and producers and writers. And it was incredible because Warren and Q, you know, and Peter just listened to everything that um, we had to say every step of the way, which I felt like I was like, this is such a good level of progress. I know it's taken a, I know there's people who've been working towards that for decades in this industry, um, but to be here now, it felt really, really, really great. I think the funniest thing was playing a mum to Callan, who's like nine years younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> oh, the man, the myth, the legend, Callan to Sony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it worked. It really worked. Huge it did. It did. Kudos to everybody. It was um. Yeah. real team effort from makeup to costume to <laughs> acting to everyone to make us look like a mother and son duo it was yeah, yeah <laughs> we'd actually we actually realized we were like oh we couldn't spend too much time together um of like out, out of work or even before scenes because our 
relationship would descend very quickly into sibling <laughs> sibling relationship <laughs> which i suppose is, is right if you're a super young mom yeah you're a cool mom you're a regular mom <laughs> No, you guys are so funny together. Your chemistry and your banter is just <laughs> off the roof. So good. Same, same to you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So then in reflection of your experience on the highs and on the sapphires and on all those other amazing shows, what in your career has been the biggest obstacles or the hardest parts and then what were the strategies you used to get through it or overcome it? Yeah, um, I suppose, you know, the obvious one is the downtime. Mm. Um, what do you do when you're not working? How do you keep working when you're not working? And uh, I think um, I came out of NIDA and I, the first thing I said to my agent was I make a promise to myself to do a play a year. Um, I had a few classmates who, you know, th through their own personal taste, were like, I'm just going to stick to film and screen. And I was like, cool, that sounds really hard <laughs> because we don't make enough here in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm a big believer in um, stage practice, absolutely feeding some of the greatest actors on screen as well. Um, so I, I made a promise to myself to do a play a year, uh, whether it was main stage or independent, and, and I've stuck to that. This is my first year off doing a play. I figured I directed one, so I was still a part it of counts. that. It counts. I'm sure. I'm, I'm like, yeah, it's, I acted a lot in that rehearsal room, believe me. <laughs> I acted like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Go, girl. Um, I, yeah, so um, keeping involved um, in the theatre scene was a massive, massive thing that saved me. Um, and not... Get, cutting yourself some slack, you know, like six weeks after we wrapped Sapphires, I applied for a job at JB Hi-Fi and I worked there on and off for seven years after. Mm -hmm. And it was just brilliant because it was a job that I, that was really understanding towards, you know, last minute shift schedule cancellations or changing because of auditions or shoot days or things like that. Um, and it was, it brought in money. I was, felt like I was contributing to society by giving people dvds <laughs> no it was a um, noble a noble job <laughs> a noble cause yeah. um yeah but I, that was really important for my own um you know just i mean i'm in a relationship with my partner we've been together for 19 years um and yeah. to feel like you know i was still contributing to the household financially and and in that sense um meant that i was never kind of i never felt too bad about not being out of work as an actor mm. um so I think, yeah, finding your, you know, your casual jobs and the jobs that'll keep you just moving and going. Um, I guess the downtime, yeah, um, the hardest things. Uh, they, they're kind of specific, I suppose, to um, something that, that I found quite funny was I always went through drama school thinking I wouldn't get to play Indigenous characters or Aboriginal characters because I didn't look like you know, um, white Australia or, or non-Aboriginal Australia's um, definition of what an Aboriginal person should look like. Mm. But then I came out and once Sapphires had hit the, hit the screens, suddenly it felt like casting didn't know where to put me. Like she says she's Aboriginal, so we can't put her in white roles, but also she's too white to be really Aboriginal. So we can't put her in that Aboriginal role. So there's, I know that there's been a, f a few funny instances in that where I, I've felt the, um, you know, the sting of the industry in that way, I guess. Mm. But, um, you know, I'm, that's very much just on an individual level and, yeah. and speaking from where I come from, it's like, well, I am who I am. And I, I'm a, um, I think actors by nature are big positive, believe, you know, believers, like the fact that we go decide to go to a, drama school for three years to pursue our career means we have a level of inbuilt sort of positivity and and um and I I'm not to get all the secret on people but I I do I do believe in a lot of um I have a genuine belief that everything will be okay <laughs> and I know yeah. that that's doesn't work for everybody but it's what's yeah. gotten me through yeah I mean it makes sense because so so much of it is out of our control so if Absolutely. we don't believe that something will happen when it needs to happen and life will be tough yeah yeah and and um I think that's a big part of it as well you know like leaving 
going to every audition and knowing, doing the work prior to the audition, prior to the rehearsal room, so that I know I've done everything within my control to be considered for that role. And if it's a matter of too short, too tall, too white, too, you know, not, not black enough, too white, um, hair's brown, like things like that, that's not on me, that's on yeah. other people. Um, yeah, so that, that was a big thing, knowing that at every turn I, I give, do my best work and walk out of the audition room and kind of tear up my script and go, I'm done, yeah. I gave it everything I've got and it's in their hands now. Yeah. And I'm not the decision maker and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. really great practice. That's really amazing. So what is, say, an audition lens on your lap or um, a play lens on your lap or work in general? You've got it. Um, do you have a specific process that you go through or do you use different tools depending on the job? How does it usually work for you? Yeah, different tools depending on the job. Mm -hmm. um, I think something that I really love about acting is learning to speak every director's language um, and, and trying to, I'm a big believer in like, you know, if a director says I want you to walk up there because it looks good on stage, then I find it's my job to find the reason why my character would do that. I'm, yeah, I'm, make it I'm, work. I'm, yeah I've, I'm very, I don't think I've ever kind of pulled the old, my character wouldn't do that because you know, all we have is the text on the page and mm -hmm. everything your character says and does, everything your character says is inevitable. Um, and you have to trust that outside of you, the director is doing their best to bring a, you know, cohesively bring a story and all the elements together. So, um, yeah, speaking, learning to kind of speak director's languages, um, cast members as well, you know, learning how to, operate in a room full of eight people or, or, or two. Um, that's something that I really enjoy. I guess my go-to, my immediate go-to, no matter what, is uh, Kevin Jackson's um, Creative Habit, which is um, the first thing I do with any script, whether it's theatre or film, whether it's an ad or a voiceover, is, is mark out my punctuation and my syntax, circle my verbs, my end, underline my end of lines, um, highlight, you know, red marks around all the all the um, commas and full stops and things like that um, as because as Kevin Jackson once said you know your characters punctuate the syntax is the way your character breathes um, and that's Very automatically nice. something that I go oh that gets me out of my head and and starts getting me into someone else's so yeah yeah that's great that's a great way in yeah yeah really cool that's so nice. um if you did have to start your career all over again, knowing everything you know now, what would you say to Shari or to young Ooh. actors in general? Oh, um, to young actors in general, don't take it too seriously. I know yeah. It's so hard because we just, we want it with every single fibre of our being. Actually, no, on top of that, I would say, um, stay, focus on your lane and, um, don't get caught up on other people's ideas or versions of success mm. because, you know, we all go in wanting, like everyone wants a Hollywood career and there's no shame in saying that you want that. Um, but there also, for me, there came a time where it was like, actually, do I want that? Because, you know, I've, 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 I know so many actors who kind of make a move to the States and, and are there for five years and, and have a couple of guest roles. But I then had to, and that's their journey and that's awesome like to have the means to do that and the support to do that and the and the, the gumption to keep going but for me I then went it's all right to uh to want to stay here and want to tell my people's stories like that was a big redefining of my my understanding of success mm. um and and letting myself be okay with loving theater and you know not I think yeah don't compare yourself to others Mm. everyone's journey is so incredibly different and is you know half by chance man <laughs> like yeah like, said, like we can't we can't fucking hard work yeah, yeah totally, fucking <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah so uh focus on your lane um constantly ask yourself what your version of success is and let yourself define that don't let anyone else define that for you and 
don't take it too seriously. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I also just want to say to everyone watching both on Facebook and over Zoom, um, you can ask questions to Shara yourself. So if anyone has any burning questions, please send it through and then hopefully it will make it through the ether and yeah. show me to them. <laughs> Amazing. So, so you've worked for a number of years in the industry and you've had an incredible career and now you're working as a director as well. So in your opinion, where do you think the industry is at at the moment? Because I know it's shifted so much over the last couple of years and um, big changes have been made, really important changes. Yeah. And do you have any reflection on that or do you think it it's yeah. going the right way and it needs to be somewhere else? What do you think? Um, I guess it's, uh, you know, big, big shifts have, have happened um, and they have been long and arduous and um, time consuming for a lot of people. And, and a lot of people have tapped out because they haven't come fast enough. I think what's really interesting about this year is um, my biggest takeaway, I suppose, has also been, has been um, you know, COVID happened. Obviously, we all know that. And then in the midst of that, Black Lives Matter ramped right back up again for good reason. And um, I think as we've seen in, you know, perhaps it's, it's, it's no shade, but maybe there's a little bit of shade when we see things like Queensland Theatre Company come out and announce a new, a new program season, season without any Indigenous work. My, my immediate concern, that's just an example um, on a broader subject of my immediate concern is when things get too hard, when push comes to shove, the learned behaviours that people in the industry, white people, um, able-bodied people, you know, when people in this industry have, have had to make decisions, then the, their learned behaviours of inclusivity and, and genuine diverse representation are the first things to fall by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And I'm really worried that that's, um, I think what we've seen this year is um, a huge spike in accessibility and how theatre and art has become much more readily available to audiences that it otherwise wouldn't have been. And I don't think we can go back from that. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can go back from, um, you know, our, our understanding of, I mean, I hate the term colorblind casting. I just think it's bullshit to erase anyone, a part of anyone's identity in order to, for them to fit into your room. Um, I think we have to keep pushing for black and brown and um, Asian people and, and um, people of color and culturally and linguistically diverse people. I think there's, you know, all of the, uh, you know, the boxes that we have to tick on forms and all that kind of crap. Um, they're there for a reason though. And I, I just um, sort of rambling a bit now, but I suppose my, my big concern for this year is that we don't go backwards. We have a chance to define a new normal, mm. one that should be fair and equitable for everybody. And I know that people can get scared really easily. Um, I was reminded today by a friend that it's, it's easy to do the right thing when it's, when it's easy. Mm. It's, it's harder to do it when, it's, when times are tough, but we have to keep pushing. And yeah. now more than ever, I think 2020 is the, the big it felt like a big equalizer for a lot of us mm. and I hope it I hope we stay on that trajectory yeah 100% so in order to maintain that trajectory and keep moving forward how do you think we as practitioners can ensure that that keeps happening is it um, mindfulness is it accountability is it yeah I think accountability is one thing I know um, recently um, and this isn't a plug for Sydney Theatre Company. I mean, Darlinghurst did one as well. You know, the pledges that have come out of theatre companies recently in the last sort of six months or so, um, I think are really exciting. I think it's, you know, I remember saying it's great that we now have a piece of, a piece of paper or a piece of text on the internet that communities can go to and say, you said you were doing this by now and that hasn't happened. So what the hell or what are you doing to make sure it's happening or can we see the proof that you are enacting upon these um you know statements that you're making um so i think i guess as actors and artists we just have to keep having conversations in any room we're in and don't be afraid to um speak 
on behalf, you know, your truth and the on, and the community you represent. And I think to anyone in leadership positions, don't be afraid to listen. Like, just shut up and listen. <laughs> it's, you know, that's a big thing. White Australia has got to learn, or non-Aboriginal Australia has got to learn. Um, but it's something that every one of us, you know, that um, tick any kind of form of privilege, have to keep practicing. So yeah, mindfulness, I guess, in that sense. Um, but also it's time to have some really tough conversations and don't shy away from them. Um, yeah. 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 I think it's a really important time in our industry and in every industry. And within, yeah. 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 It, it feels like it. It certainly feels like um, I think what we've all realized is technology is playing a part in, in all of our industries, whether we like it or not. And let's learn to use that to our advantage and, and you know, Com connect communities and and bring them to the forefront yeah totally yeah so important so moving forward for you you've had um you've had an amazing career and you continue to do so Thank and you. you're now working as a director and an actor like what's the vision for you shari sevens what's what's the dream what's happening oh man what's the dream Oof. um can my goal is to continue working on new Australian work, Indigenous mm -hmm. um, or not. Um, my goal is to make sure that um, every position of leadership I find myself in, that I am bringing people from minorities in with me and um, keeping doors open um, and, and learning and, and constantly checking my own privilege and my own self. Um, I, I was talking to Wesley Enoch and Rhoda Roberts, two icons of Aboriginal theatre the other day, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and Nakia Louie was there. It was amazing. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, the conversation about a national Aboriginal theatre came up again. And Ooh. I don't know if I'd be the, I, it's, it's so, like, it's a, it's a conversation that's been had for years. It's something that's been yeah. done before. But I was like, ah, oh, you know, is that, is that something that's on my table to kind of look at? I don't know. I think we need to look at a way to make sure all our states and territories are represented in, in the arts, um, that our Indigenous artists and Black artists and Brown artists and artists of colour are represented. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, at, and I, you know, when I say that, I, I mean at every intersection as well of um, LGBTQIA plus people and people with disabilities. And I, I think um, I, any, I'm just like, bring everyone in, man. What yeah. are we doing? We're ripping ourselves off from so many incredible stories. Like every new artist I meet or work with that comes from a different background or a different intersection of Aboriginality or um, anything, you know, I just think, ah, oh, I've just, I've, I've missed out. Like, yeah. and we've missed out. Like Australian audiences have missed out. Communities have missed out on representation and we've missed out on learning and entertainment. Yeah. You know, like, totally. Yeah. So you, I you think know. that's a really exciting part about this. Um, shift is that not only is it representation for representation's sake it's really exciting to see stories that are so meaningful to so many different groups and yeah. so many different intersectionalities when they haven't been able to see themselves or a version of themselves represented within this sphere absolutely and um, there's a really um I was doing auditions the other day for a play that I'm working on next year. I'm trying to make sure I talk about this without name dropping anything that I'm not supposed to. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had a non-binary actor come in and audition for both the um, male identifying and female identified roles. And it just, I just went, here is someone so connected to the text. And I then, every, this text that I said that I, I'd been sitting with for weeks, you know, for months now really, I was like, it just, I just found my brain doing a little shift and going, wow, the words took on such a different meaning. And, and, and I was like, we keep, you know, that yes, there's an, like, I'm all for new work, but I was like, there is absolutely room in every one of these classics for us to reimagine roles for anyone. Totally. And, you know, and I, I use the word classics in the, in the white sense there, but I, um, we have to start looking at, the non-white Western classics as well from around the world. And, and it just made me start thinking about, yeah, what space and um, how little it costs really and how we, it's something that we must do. And I probably will I'll have to call myself out on this quite a few times in my career. And I, I look forward to being called out on it to be <laughs> accountable. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's, yeah, the most exciting part. Um, 
it's ever evolving it's ever yeah. changing and we need to listen we need to pay attention we need to learn and we need to soak up all the um amazing stories and ideas that are coming through like that's Absolutely. something we can all all yeah get stuff out of um i'm gonna say again if anyone has a question please pass it on um and i'm sure shari would be more than happy to answer it um now shari you've taken on a lot of amazing roles and played a lot of incredible incredible characters do you have a particular role that um i know we've discussed your favorite roles but is there any role that you actually find quite cathartic or quite juicy and exciting? And is that something you really look for or do you just make the most of the role that's given to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's quite, um, I mean, this question in, in my direction specifically as an Aboriginal actor, it's, it's it, you know, it can be quite traumatic um, and confronting, you know, say to be doing, um, I mean, what did I think we did in 2016? I did Radiance and the Bleeding Tree and Black is the New White, and that, or 2015 maybe. Gosh, um, it was. It wasn't till then I was like, wow, it's been like back to back trauma <laughs> as an Aboriginal woman and as a woman. <laughs> um, yeah. And and so I, I suppose um, at the start of my career, things felt cathartic, and now they can feel a little bit tiresome they can feel a little yeah. bit I know Ursula Jovic um famously said a few years back that she was take retiring from acting because she was sick of playing rape victims and domestic violence victims and Rhoda Roberts and Lydia Miller two icons of Aboriginal theatre from their time also quit also said that they was they commissioned Radiance actually they commissioned it they commissioned Louis now to write a play about three sisters and they didn't want Aboriginality mentioned at all in the play because they were like we're sick of playing um yeah women who get flogged and women who you know who are abused and and um traumatized their whole lives who are mm -hmm. raped and beaten up as well so yeah it's um it gets to that stage black is a new white actually was the first time i i always kind of talk about it was the first time i remember a whole family of aboriginal people walking out on stage and feeling instinctively welcomed and loved and not judged and um that's why that why do you think that was um the vehicle of it you know Nakia was so clever in in subverting um the rom-com genre and sort of trojan horsing it and putting black people in a space where they had never been put before which was in a really upper class like upper middle class um holiday home <laughs> that mm. I, i'll never get to live in <laughs> um so for a lot of audience members you know people people automatically saw good clothes and a nice house and just went mm. oh I can identify with these people um I'm not going to pity them um and so that was really enjoyable for me that was cathartic in a way because it was the undoing of all the the kind of trauma that you know you, you crave as a younger actor because you want to mm. sink your teeth in and you want to get get into you know the the depths of despair of the human psyche yeah <laughs> And then when you spend too long there, you're like, oh, get me out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I just relish any opportunity. I'm really looking for, I'm, I really want to do something with an accent one day though. <laughs> yeah? I just love accents, man. <laughs> I just love doing like a Scottish accent or something. Just like so not not where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> They're so juicy. So yeah. juicy. Northern yeah. like, Irish. I don't know why. It's so dumb. <laughs> I'm sure you'll make that happen. I have no doubt. <laughs> I have absolutely no doubt. Oh, thanks, babe. Girls got to have goals. <laughs> got to have goals. Got to keep yourself going. <laughs> That's so good. As um, I, I guess I ask this because I know sometimes as a disabled actor, as a disabled woman playing disabled roles, um, I always feel that they're really important roles. But um, but I also know that my disabled experience is very unique to myself because it's such a spectrum. Every experience is unique. And that's something I always really think about in my work when I'm playing disabled characters and really grapple with that. Is that something that um, as an Aboriginal actor, as an Aboriginal woman, do you think about those ideas and does it influence yeah. your work? Yeah, totally. I'm for me, you know, I, I 
I'm a fair-skinned black fella, so my um, understand my my lived experience of Aboriginality, while it's up, my Aboriginality has always been a part of my life, and it's not something um, that I've ever had to hide or be ashamed of, because I come from such an incredible family, and um, um, you know I've always been taught to be proud of who I am, and and I didn't actually realise that I wasn't black or someone's idea of Aboriginal um, until I left Darwin because everybody knows who I am in Darwin. They know my family. They can tell by looking at you who you're related to. Um, so I, I absolutely um, every, you know, you do, I get, you do the same thing. It's like you pick up the script and go, how does this represent my community? Um, is this a, a, a true representation? Is it, is, does it feel tokenistic? Um, is it problematic and why is it problematic? Um, but also as a fair skinned Aboriginal woman, there's been roles, many roles that I've turned down because I, I don't have the right to play the role of someone who has been um, vilified for the color of their skin, because that's just, that's not my experience. I have white privilege in this country, in, in this world. Um, you know, I can get a taxi, I can get a job interview, I can, all of those things. Um, so it, yeah, it's definitely something that I think about every, 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 um, every, every, offer that comes up or every chance to audition comes up yeah mm, mm. and that that must be a lot to um that must be a big part of your work but also um that must be a lot to grapple with as well like making yeah. sure that um you're aware of that and it bring you bring those ideas to your work that would be yeah, yeah take it's a lot to work with yeah, I think it's definitely something, I mean, you'd know it, like you said, being a disabled woman, like um, I always think about the integrity of the role. Like, mm. is this someone that's real? Mm. And is this, is this other, other creators behind this damaging my community or are they empowering my community? Yeah. Uh, I guess in, in, in comedy terms, it's kind of, am I punching up or down or that kind of thing? Totally, yeah. And I, I never, ever want to do anything that would jeopardise the integrity of my, my people. So, mm. yeah. And is that a conversation you feel like you can share with the people you're working with and the creatives and yeah. the um, leaders on the board? Only now at being yeah. in the industry, I'm very much aware of uh, my privilege as a working actor in this industry to now have you know, um, 11 years of, of work under my belt and, a, and somewhat of a, a platform, I suppose, or a career and the, the safety to be able to say to my agent, I'm going to turn down this role and these are the reasons why and can you please pass this on to the producer? Mm -hmm. So I've found that, I've only found that voice in the last maybe four years or so um, and it was kind of tentative and meek at first, but but now I'm just like, no, this is racist. <laughs> I'm yeah. not this is a fairly racist interpretation you need to fix this before you send this to anyone else <laughs> yeah and what was it that um empowered you to be able to say that and to be like you know what I need to call this someone has to I'm gonna do it was there yeah. a shift or was it just the cultural shift or um, where did you find I that? think it was the cultural shift of of feeling like okay I feel like I've been working enough now to know that I I will be able to, if I keep working hard, um, I will continue to find, you know, work will, be, you know, I, I, I guess I'll keep getting work in a sense. And I know that without sounding like a wanker or a snob, um, I'm fairly confident that I'll get to keep working as an actor mm -hmm. uh, because I've worked hard at it, not because I'm, I'm lucky or, you know, or because of diversity or anything. Um, it, I, I put in hard work and um, mm -hmm. there has been that cultural shift, but I know I have the safety net of, of a 10 year career that says, I'm not going to go anywhere. Hopefully <laughs> watch me eat my words. Look at the crowd, I'll be like, I don't think you're going anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think you need to say. <laughs> <laughs> Try and get rid of me. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's, it's that it's absolute um, secure in the knowledge that I, I have a, I have a career and, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and also secure in the knowledge now that if uh, if I don't speak out, things won't change and it's time for speaking out. It's time for calling people out. I don't believe in cancel culture. Mm. I believe in like call out culture, like absolutely hold people accountable, give them the opportunity to change and make amends and learn. Mm. Yeah. 100%. Well, you're doing really amazing work <laughs> and I respect you so much 
and I'm still such a fangirl, <laughs> even though we know we work with each other. Oh, but my gosh. Ditto, babe. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Oh, amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Shari. I, I really appreciate it. And your insights have been incredible. And, um, yeah, I felt really privileged to have this conversation. With oh, you. me too, Brady. Absolutely. I, I just love everything you do and your tenacity and hard work and the choices and I just think you're incredible and I just I just want to say one of my parting notes um, when I graduated NIDA in 2009 we'd just come through the global financial crisis and one of our guest speakers came in and said I, I bet you're hearing a lot of like it's now well, now's not really a good time to be an actor and then he said but guess what it's never a good time to be an actor <laughs> so for all the new grads just keep on going man it's a race it's it's a marathon not a race just exactly stay you gotta yeah. keep doing what you're doing yeah keep hustling <laughs> amazing well another another amazing little nugget of gold sorry seven thank you <laughs>